doing, Jay? I just, I just couldn't go home. I couldn't. <laughs> okay. No, no, you, you, you go and sell some trees. You do you, and, and we'll talk whenever you're done. We may be here all night. It's Christmas Eve. There's parents that, you know, put the tree up overnight. What? So, Santa delivers the presents, mm -hmm. brings the tree, decorates it. There's still some Christmas stuff the night before, but not a lot. And then, suddenly, the magic happens. My parents used to do that for us when I was little, and I loved it, but now I, I don't know. I just, I think I want the magic all the time. You're an atheist. I know, but I mean the magic of Christmas lights in the living room and those little dehydrated marshmallows and the hot cocoa, and sharing a blanket with another person. <laughs>
for like ten dollars on eBay, but I wouldn't sell it if I were you. No, I, no, no, no. I, I just hate to think that you give me something that's valuable when I can't get you anything in return. Well, hmm. you could get me a a, a tree. <laughs> When I was little, I would spin in circles, knowing at some point I was facing my mother. She left when I was four.
threw leaves and grass on her, a shroud, and they circled her. They circled her. They circled her, and they cried. It was then I realized I had been spinning in the wrong plane. My mom wasn't here. She was here. I could spin and spin, and I was never going to face her. Not in this lifetime. And suddenly, I remembered that Babar's mother had been killed by a hunter. And maybe I knew. Maybe I always knew. And then Trump never forgets. And unlike Dumbo, elephants don't fly. Oh, <laughs> 
lovely setter. And of course, tea. Tea! To the left. To the other left. Mufasa, when you died and Simba was at the mercy of Scar? I 
have never felt that type of pain for a Disney character. <laughs> there has never been a dress like you. The way you sat on my shoulders and my hips, I felt royal. Why did I put you in the washer instead of giving you to the dry cleaner? <laughs> to this day, I can't. I just can't. Prince, not only my heart, but millions, millions. And you, and you. We were meant to grow old with our three kids, two dogs, but not as good as you, Charlie. We were meant to go to Istanbul together and try ayahuasca. And we were meant to never, never have you cheat on me. Because when that happened, it took years for the pain to subside. Sonia, you know you're the unsung hero of Uncle Vanya. And your last monologue? It was brief. It was hot, explosive. Best two day affair of my life. And when it was over, it still crushed me. I passed you on a street corner five days ago. You were crying. I don't know why. I don't know you, but I saw you and I felt your pain. I should have done this. It's what my granddad always said. People want to be seen and acknowledged. Oh shit, sorry, they're calling me. I have to go. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of you. I'm sure new heartbreaks will fill the new hearts. But I hope I get to see some of you again. I need you, and I love you. And then by Christine Weaves. Time we met, but I 
definitely remember the first time you hated me. It was in that awful freshman speech class on rhetoric and the three artistic proofs. Remember? Ethos, pathos, logos. The professor made us work in teams. Yeah. Yeah, wow. It was you, me, and Crazy Johnny. Johnny would just sit there and say the most awful, banal shit, just being disgusting. He had these water blisters on his index finger, and he would dig at them with a paper clip until this yellow pussy liquid would burst out all over the desk. It was so gross, and I'm pretty sure in your heart you felt the same way, but you acted nonchalant about it, to be contrarian, exactly like you still do. You didn't act that way the first time you found him, passed out with a needle in his arm, but whatever. That was months later. So the assignment was, each person on the team was supposed to give a speech demonstrating one of the persuasive elements on a designated topic. Or in this case, pets are not property. Except they are in America, but the professor really didn't want them to be, and neither did his cat, uh, uh, Kitty Poppins. <laughs> he used to come with him to class every day on a leash. <laughs> I took ethos because it was easy. Listen to me, I could say. You can trust me. I was salutatorian of my class, which means I'm smart, but I'm insecure. <laughs> First generation American, which means I had to work my ass off to get here, but I grew up thinking I was poor, even though I was probably only a little bit lower middle class than you were. So I'm real, but not threatening. <laughs> I grew up worrying about my own moral compass because the powers that feigned to deal in matters of the soul could not be trusted. And I use $10 words like feign in everyday conversation, not because I want to sound pretentious, but because I read more than I talk to people, and I really don't know how to talk to people. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I didn't say any of that. I just said, I volunteer at an animal shelter, Pets are not property. <laughs> Johnny, he took logos. I honestly don't remember what he said. Just that he was friggin' smart. Smarter than any of us. I mean, it's one thing to work hard and make straight A's. It's another to manage that while you're burnishing your drug addiction like it's your resume. And you. You, we stuck with pathos. <laughs> What a shit thing to do, but you took it, and you got up there, and you told this story about your dog who'd been hit by an ice cream truck when you were 11 years old. How you ran out into the street and held her bloody, seizing body in your arms. And there we were, you, me, Crazy Johnny standing up in front of a classroom of 30 people who just sat and stared silently while your voice shook. While you talked about how this dog had laid at the foot of your bed every night since you were born. And I thought, this can't be true. When you said how the dog was running after you when the ice cream truck struck, and how the jingle music that they played to lure children out into the street just kept playing and playing. How ridiculous, I thought, that you would make up a story like this. And I heard myself chuckle. I gasped. I held my breath. I knew I couldn't. I shouldn't. But that just made it worse. And you said that you made your mother drive the lifeless body to the vet because you thought you could still save her. And I hideously cackled and snorted. My whole body was racked with laughter. I had to walk out. I knew then that you would hate me because 
because I was actually hateful. And I had to fix it. Because the breach was so terrible and so complete. I had no other option after that but to be utterly kind to you. I used up all the evil I had in me on you. And if I couldn't be kind, at least I could lie to you until you believed that I wasn't the villain in this story. Except there are no villains. I don't know if you've heard, so I'm just gonna say it. Johnny Sabato's dead. I don't know how. I haven't talked to him since graduation. I keep thinking about what he said to you. The first time you found him, before it came to seem normal, he didn't know how he'd gotten back to our dorm, let alone a janitor's closet, and he said, like, who cares? I'm not going to live past 30 anyway. He was so limp, and you were holding him. And you called me to come help, to come get him to the hospital, because he was too heavy for you. And I did. I did because I loved you. I loved you in a way that you can only love someone who you are absolutely sure hates you. I'm pretty sure that was the day I convinced you that you were my best friend. But I'm equally sure that underneath it all, you still hate me. And I'm still trying not to laugh. Can you call me when you get off work? I miss you.
my beliefs reflect the way I was raised the GOP. Carol. <laughs> I will not sit here and let this little GOP tell me that I caused them to be this way. What are you trying to say? You weren't born like this. You choose to be like this. <laughs> yeah, I admit that's kind of the whole premise here. Uh, people choose the political ideology they like, and that doesn't mean that they change as a person. It Get out! No, dear! Dear, you would subjugate me with belittling epithets of affection to try and silence me. <laughs> well, call me traditional, but I will not tolerate this intolerance in my home. But, Mom, your control character is dead. <laughs> Bruce, what are we going to do? We raised a street Republican! <laughs> <laughs> Continue that tradition once I'm gone. 
Hide my tracks as best you can, old bean. Lest they lead back to your doorstep. <laughs> oh God. Desire. Desire. 
For me, I don't think it's the clowns that penetrate. I think, perhaps, the side shifts. There's sadness, don't you agree? I watch. Yes, I watch even as I don't want to, even as I know it is somehow their job to entertain me, to get me to watch. But I feel like watching is, it's like looking into something where display is akin to being veiled, because we don't really see the humanity in the sideshow. We see the freaks, don't we? The beautiful, bearded lady. Is she real? Is it glue? Does the glue hold her together as it holds us together? In truth, in life, desire? What is your glue? What is my glue? What does the beard hide? Like the clown's mask, yes. Like the actor's facade. In the cafes of Paris, this one's my favorite, Café Solitaire. I sit behind my Café Olé, the air heavy with the aroma of browning beans as they burst, mixed with beignet sweetness and the delicate coconut and bitterness of dark chocolate macaroons. And I hide. The aromas hide me because they draw patrons to the counter and away from the frail little girl sitting here behind her oversized mug trying to feel the character she is reading. She's becoming. These things hide me, yes. Yet when I'm ready, what do I do? I get up on stage and I expose myself, my soul, my creative invention and bloodless ritual of reality. But it isn't reality, is it? It's a mask. It's a beard. The veil, acting, facade, disguise, desume. I want you to watch me as I watch the bearded lady. I want you to believe my disguise, my creative invention. Up on the stage, in the dark, in my light. We will walk around for hours, and I want you to feel what I feel when I look at the freaks in the circus. Feel sadness when you look at me. Feel pain when I'm cut. I want you to lift my veil to your own truth, insanity, desire, where I become you. And you become me. We drift into the space that can only be occupied by sideshow freaks, actors, and in the best of that disquiet, where we attain our desire, yet still question it. We occupy that space with us. We leave the bloodless ritual of reality at the tent opening or the stage door, and we become one. In that miracle, where little by little only children, saints, and Lunatics are engaged, mind and eyes. I want you to give up your hold on reality to see me, to pull away my disguise, my veil. I want us to swallow swords together, you in your seat, me on the stage. We in that breath where truth and desire become insane, and that insanity feeds us, makes us one. My beard sheared away for you. Only you. Me for you. Acting is insane. And I want to be your sideshow. You're freak. I feel sadness when you look at me. Let me frighten you. And ultimately, let me show you your desires.